This is Besom D20. It's not liked by a whole lot of people, but truth be told, even though I called it a monstrosity earlier, this is probably one of my favorite books by Guardians of Order. It's got a lot of really cool ideas in it. So today, we're going to look at what makes this a unique book. Big Eye Small Mouth D20 was released towards the end of the lifespan of Guardians of Order. On the surface, it's a D20 splat book filled with all kinds of classes meant to emulate anime tropes. Which, that isn't too far from the truth. That's what this is. It's kind of a mix between Big Eye Small Mouth and the D20 system, exactly as it says on the tin. It takes ideas from both games and creates a crazy multi-genre game powered by one of the most popular game mechanics in the world whose titular die of choice somehow came to represent tabletop gaming. Guardians of Order took a look at the D&D 3rd Edition rules in the D20 system, and then analyzed its workings. They came to the conclusion that D&D 3rd Edition was imbalanced, and filled with quite a few character options that, simply put, were mistakes if you chose them. This was something that Mont Cook, who was in charge of the creation of D&D 3rd Edition, was not only aware of, but for a time prided himself on. So, with that in mind, Guardians of Order took it upon themselves to overhaul what they thought was a good and familiar gaming resource, and they did so by reskinning it with what they were familiar with. Japanese animation. Besom D20's new classes each offer something unique that you'd be hard-pressed to find in one of the other new classes, while at the same time, it makes sure each class is useful when compared to one of the others. What puts the Big Eye Small Mouth and Big Eye Small Mouth D20, though, is the special abilities and character points they added. You generally only gain these character points if your class allows you to. It's a little slapdash, but I think it balanced out the game some. Some of the new classes they added, like Ninja and Hot Rod, gain a lot of different class features each level. So, to fill in the gaps for other classes like Tech Genius or Student, the latter two gained more character points when they leveled up. They even included a generic adventurer class that possessed no real strengths or weaknesses, but they gave it the most character points as it progressed to level 20. And they also kind of noted that it's overall weaker, but its strength is that it's a lot more flexible than all the other classes. And this brings me to another thing I really like about Besom D20. It explains its design decisions. It left a note about adventure being weaker than most of the other classes, but also explained that it was also the most flexible. Big Eye Small Mouth D20 was also designed with the realization that players of Dungeons & Dragons will most likely multi-class, sometimes even with multiple classes, and thus they exempted one of the D&D 3rd Edition rules about experience penalties if you had more than one class. And speaking of content from D&D 3rd Edition, they also rebuilt the classes from that as classes for Besom D20, mostly by adding in character points where the original classes would get very little or nothing at all classes such as Fighter, Ranger, or Rogue. Meanwhile, most of the spellcasting classes didn't really gain anything. Now, I've sung a lot of praises about this game so far, and rightfully so. I have a soft spot for games with a lot of customization, and Big Eyes Small Mouth D20 offers plenty of that in a very tantalizing way. I did say the game wasn't very well liked though, so I would be remiss if I didn't point out some of the flaws that it has. I personally love the ideas behind rules being explained. After all, one of my favorite games is Hero System, which is hundreds upon hundreds of pages of explanations. However, these sorts of explanations can get a little distracting, especially if all you're concerned with is what the rules are. A good place for these sorts of explanations is either in an out-of-the-way sidebar or another chapter. Besom D20 instead packs as much information as possible into the pages including their explanations. This makes the book a bit of a difficult read, since the sidebars they use for explaining their design choices are also the same or at least very similar to other rules information. Besom D20 also keeps the process of randomizing stats during character creation, which on its own would be fine. However, Besom D20 then goes through a process of bouncing out characters with high stats with those that have low stats by giving out or taking away extra character points. Never mind that you can use your character points to raise your stats or lower your stats to get more character points during character creation. Basically, the random stats in Besom D20 are kinda pointless. 
The only reason I can think to keep randomized stats is as a starting point for a character. I mean, one of the big problems I've noticed with Hero System and many other games that give this much freedom when making a character is that many players can easily cripple their character without realizing it. So I guess to that end, randomizing everybody's stats makes it so that everybody does have a decent, somewhat common starting point. Ultimately though, somebody could still have the wanton idea to lower one of their stats to a practically useless level just so they can have another stat be absurdly high. Another flaw I have with this book is that it relies pretty heavily on a lot of the material from the original D&D 3rd edition book, with one of the rules it relies on being the method of generating stats. We already discussed that though, and it's kind of a minor gripe compared to this next thing they omitted. One of the abilities they added was called Dynamic Sorcery, and it allows a character to use energy points, another thing they added, to cast spells. Dynamic Sorcery is on a scale from 1 to 10, with each level corresponding to one of the spell levels from Dungeons and Dragons, going from 0 to 9. This meant that a character with enough energy points could cast any spell if they had a high enough Dynamic Sorcery level. The thing that's problematic about this though is that it doesn't quite explain how to handle using spells that scale with spellcaster level. Take Magic Missile for example. It gets more powerful as the caster levels up, shooting an additional blast every two levels. How exactly to handle a spell like that isn't covered in Besom D20. Normally, I don't sweat GMs coming up with their own rules, but with something like the ability to bend reality, I would kind of prefer some clearer guidelines. That's about the extent of the flaws of this book. Though I do have a few other things I want to mention that I didn't really have a strong opinion about one way or the other. First is that they use an optional rule from the D&D 3rd edition Dungeon Master's Guide where characters roll for their defense when they're attacked. This means that a character's base armor class is just their dexterity modifier. They also added combat and defense skills, allowing a character to raise their attack and defense for specific kinds of combat, using their skill points. This is, once again, something I don't feel very strongly about, but I do have to say it's a nice addition since it opens up the game a little bit and gives characters just a little bit more customization. There's also special abilities that you can spend character points on to raise your base armor class or attack bonus or to increase the amount of skill points you have. It's also worth noting, however, that most classes only have a few combat and defense skills listed as their class skills, if any. Though each class also gets so many new abilities when they level up that it should be pretty easy for somebody to correct a bad decision when leveling up their character. But enough talk, let's actually look at the book now. So here it is, Big Eye Small Mouth D20. This is, it says Anime Role Player's Handbook, but I don't really think there was a DMG. There wasn't really one I could find. And right off the bat, it is, it is a big book, big pages, I like that. It's hardback, hardbacks are nice, I like hardbacks as well. And the pages that are about 140, so it's a little bit smaller than, like, say, Dungeons and Dragons, than, say, the Dungeons and Dragons player's handbooks, which usually range anywhere from about 30 to 50. So let's go ahead and take a look at the price of this one. And it looks like it's $60. Alright, you know what? You know what? We're already off to a bad start with this one. But they, they include... The production quality is at least a little bit higher than some of their other, like, full-size books. Because you got this nice little ribbon bookmark right here. It's a built-in bookmark. I actually love it when books have these. A lot of my, uh, hardcover Vampire the Masquerade and Mage the Ascension LARP books have those. So, this was a, this is a really nice touch. I actually kind of like this. So, if there's something that you're constantly referring to, you have a built-in bookmark. You don't have to find one. don't have to worry about losing one. Okay, they give you a lot of words in one in one particular page. So one page is actually just like full of information. But I think maybe the pa the words might be a little bit too small. I don't know. This is this is probably one of those one one of their books that could have benefited from just being made into an A4 size format or one of those really like half the page size just like split it down the middle like their other books. If they're going to go with tet font this small, I think maybe they were, so I think maybe they were just trying to close out like trying to save money on production value while still trying to give all the bells and whistles you'd expect. And that website I don't think that really works anymore. I think I tried to go there once. 
But yeah, you can get all this for free. I'm going to include a link to where you can find it in the description. Look, this particular art style looks really familiar for some reason, but I can't quite put my finger on it. I think maybe those like four distinct art styles they used for this particular book. You got that really nice soft image that we had earlier. This this thing. And then you've also got I think this one right here, which is I mean, well, that background could be in a better perspective, but otherwise, you know. So anyways, another thing they did was uh, all the different abilities you get, it's just sort of listed down here and you have to actually read elsewhere in the book for what the page does, for what the uh, ability does. Little bit of a, little bit of a uh, lack of foresight, because this is kind of against, this is kind of not what they did in Dungeons and Dragons books with new classes, but you got this little nifty thing right here, so like, Let's say we're looking at six cents danger to team members. All right, we know we're going to have that. We're going to go ahead and look for that elsewhere in the book. Keep this here, and then you look at what other things you have, because maybe you're level three for this Sentai member. So let's say you also have massive damage, specific attack. All right, got to look at what massive damage does. And divine relationship, also have to look what that does. Look, just put the bookmark right here. You'll always be able to quickly find your way back to this section. So this, this actually does kind of help counteract some of the design flaws of the book a little bit. So, yeah, a lot of this book is hit and miss. Some people it really missed. I'm one of the people it kind of hit for. Because if you overlook, this is the fourth art style. Which is not that weird what the fuck thing, but a lot of them have, like, TNGT over at the bottom, though they're signed. It's the unsigned ones that have a really weird style that kind of just freaks me out. I don't know who did this one, but this this actually looks like Fantasy Star Online fan art. You see, they got she has the Redria symbol right around her neck, and one of the and one of the characters in Fantasy Star Online actually one of the character models, I should say, actually has a collar which has their guild symbol in it, and that is the Redria symbol. So, and that that looks like a handgun from Fantasy Star Online. And they had giant swords in Fantasy Star Online that just had, like, they were just a giant piece of metal with laser around them. So this is definitely Fantasy Star Online line fan art, because Fantasy Star Online also used a lot of hexagons. So, yeah, yeah. Fan art, you, fan art for a Sega game made it into a role-playing game book. Okay, that's, that's actually a pretty cool-looking robot. So, list of skills, very brief description of what they do. Like, open lock, relevant ability, dexterity, specializations, combinations, electronic, padlocks, puzzle, ball, puzzle lock. The ability to open locking devices. Well, yeah, it's kind of self-explanatory. Kind of self-explanatory. I'm not really sure how you could expand on that. Here's where they made... This book is really just an explanation of how to make a character with some other weird stuff just injected in at the weird, weirdest points. Like, if we go back a little bit, right here, just right in the middle of the book, when they were telling you how to make a character, there's a deconstruction of the D20 system fantasy classes. This is one of the weird explanations of the rules that I liked, but they could have put someplace else. They could have easily put this, like, in the back of the book some somewhere, when you're not one, when you're not trying to make a character, because you're looking at like all the different stuff your character can have, what they can be, what they can do, and then you just see, here's how we did all this. Oh, now here's more rules information. That is very, very jarring, and that's actually one of the things I really didn't like. All right, just list of different weapons right here. Okay, and do, 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 do. So they at least like. Well, some of the rule suggestions they include, they at least give some new stat blocks that work along with it. As long as, like, some of the weapon and, like, equipment customizations that they had in Hot Rods and Gun Bunnies. So, this is kind of like... It's like a weird combination of three different games all in one. Besom 1st Edition, 2nd Edition, and Dungeons and Dragons, this is like, core rules. So this, I can understand why this would be jarring for a lot of people. People go into it expecting Besom or expecting Dungeons and Dragons, and they wind up with something completely different. 
that was actually just something I experienced with D20 games in general. You go into a D20 game, yeah, you know you're going to be getting something similar to Dungeons & Dragons, but at the same time, they're going to make it their own, and it's not going to work exactly like Dungeons & Dragons. Because I know that was what the Judge Dredd D20 was like, and the uh, and also what Spycraft, which was also a game that had a D20 variant as well, D tw that was also a bit like that. It had some extra rules that weren't quite D20. There was also another game called True 20, which was just a stripped-down version of a lot of Green Ronin's games, having all the fluff removed from them. Green Ronin also doing Blue Rose and Mutants and Masterminds, which is a superheroes game run by the D20 system. If I have to choose a superhero game... Okay, I feel a little uncomfortable looking at that image. If I have to choose a... Uh, a D20. If I have to choose a superhero game, I would go with Hero System all the way. After Dungeons and Dragons, that was the first role-playing game that I that I had played. That was the first non-Dungeons and Dragons role-playing game I played. Hero System, and this is possibly one of my biggest complaints about this book. Though you're looking at the index right now, you can't read anything without putting your face like three centimeters away from it. That's like about an inch, three inches, three centimeters, about an inch, and you can still barely read what it says. The index is all of... It's all of three pages long. Surely, with as much information as they crammed into this game, they could have... They could have spent a, a few pages making the index a little better. I mean, I would, I mean, with as much information as they put on here, they could have made it a little easier to read. They could have made the index a little bigger. And they could have just, like, skipped on the hardback and went with only, like, $60. We went with, like, a $60 price tag for just a bigger paperback book. Instead, you get a thin, flimsy, hard-to-read book with really weird layout designs. So... I have a lot of mixed feelings for this book, and I can understand why somebody might not like it. But I'm willing to overlook some of the some of the flaws simply because it had some really nice ideas that I liked in here. But there it, there is a lot that is wrong with it. Besides the our fact that artwork is in some places just a little weird and off putting. But I mean, it's not. I mean, there are worse games out there, so I can't say this is the worst thing I've ever seen, but it's by no means the best either. So there we have it, Big Eye Small Mouth D20. It wasn't exactly the best game that it could have been, but for the first attempt at Guardians of Order making a D20-based game, it was pretty good. It was kind of a wild departure from what people who were used to Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition probably were expecting, but... If there's any game from Guardians of Order's library that I think deserves to be remembered, it would actually be Besom D20, because all the other Besom games were just a bit too similar to GURPS. So to that end, if you wanted to play an anime-based role-playing game, I would go with either Besom D20 if you're already familiar with Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition, or I would stick with OVA. So, with all that said, I am Aaron Darshano, and I will see you all next time. Thanks for watching. We're finally done with Big Eye Small Mouth. If Besom D20 intrigued you, I put a link in the description where you can find some of the SRD files for it, along with a bunch of other Besom goodies. With all that said, I am Aaron Darshedo, and I will see you all next time.